So we shall now start with the final session. I invite Mr. Rahul Bose as well as Ms. Daisy Hazan on stage. Described as the Indian art house icon by Time magazine, Rahul Bose won the Filmfare Award 2021 for his performance in the Netflix series Bulbul. His first international award was the Best Actor Award at the Singapore Film Festival in 2000 for his performance in Split Wide Open. In 2002, at the Palm Springs Festival, he was awarded the runner-up prize for Best Debut Act Director for Everybody Says I'm Fine. This year, he has worked in four films and a major series to be released in theaters and on streaming platforms from December 2022 onwards. Formed in 2006, his NGO, The Foundation, works with children from underserved areas of India, and his second NGO, HEAL, works on the prevention of child sexual abuse. In 2009, he was voted the Indian Youth Icon of the Year, Social Justice. In 2010, the Green Globe Award for his work on climate change and in 2012, NDTV's Celebrity Sports Activist of the Year. In the same year, Rahul was conferred the Lieutenant Governor's Commendation Award for services to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. In 2013, he was awarded the Hakim Khan Sur Award for National Integration. In 2015, he was named GQ's Philanthropist of the Year and in 2017, GQ's Man of the Year Social Change. In 2017, he produced and directed Purna, a biopic on the youngest girl in history to climb Mount Everest, for which he was felicitated for excellence in direction by the, by the Directors Association of India, received the Equality in Cinema Award at the Melbourne Film Festival and the Excellence in Cinema Award at the Dublin Film Festival. He will be directing his, new fe his next feature film in April 2023. A former, a former international rugby player, Rahul, represented India for 11 years, retiring from the Indian team in 2009. He is the president of the Indian Rugby Football Union, Rugby India, as well as on the executive committee of the Asia Rugby Football Union. A prolific speaker, he has lectured on leadership, sport, gender equality, and Indian cinema at the World Bank, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, MIT, Columbia, and Cornell University, amongst others. He shall be in conversation with Daisy Hassan, who holds a PhD in media studies from the University of Wales, Swansea. She coordinates the Chevening South Asia Journalism Program and Africa Media Freedom Fellowship of the University of Westminster, London. She has written on South Asian film and media and worked on radical arts projects in the UK. Her novel, The Toilet House, published by Tara Books in 2010, a coming of age story, was long listed for the Man Asia Literary Prize and shortlisted for the Hindu Literary Prize. From literature to cinema, the actor as a character, books to film. I now hand over the session to Ms. Daisy. Thank you so much. It's such an honor and such a delight to have Rahul Bose with us this evening. How are you doing, Rahul? I know it's been a long day. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank <laughs> great, you. Great, great. Um, I'd just like to thank Mary for her dynamism and, her, uh, and, and for uh, gi her giving me this opportunity uh, to talk with Rahul Bose. I'm humbled, and I'm humbled not only because he's a celebrity, a celebrated and critically acclaimed actor and director, a sports person, an activist, a writer, um, but I'm humbled because of his artistic integrity, uh, his honesty as a human being, and his quest for excellence. So welcome again, Rahul. Uh, we know that you have links with Manipur, through your uh, foundation work. You have links with Sikkim and Darjeeling through Purna, which we'll talk about. Do you have links with Ka the Khasi Hills? Have you been here before? Yes, I've been to Meghalaya um, to shoot a film called Seshir Kobita, wow. which I shot, um, uh, I think, about seven, eight years ago. Um, I mean, who, who doesn't know that this place is stunning? Um, 
but I also know the people at the Shillong Chamber Choir uh, for many years, and I was uh, devastated to hear of Neil's passing. Devastated. I, I cannot think of such a such a beautiful, pure, um, childlike genius. So I was really devastated to hear about that. I still am. I'm meeting them tomorrow evening. Um, you know, it's so fashionable to come into a place and say, I love this place and say good things about the place. But I hardly know Meghalaya, let's face it. So I'm not going to waste your time or disrespect the audience by saying stuff like that. But what I will say is that the grace, the gentleness, uh, and the intelligence that I've experienced whenever I've spoken to people here uh, is something that is fast fading in other parts of the world uh, as the world becomes more violent and frankly more stupid. Um, I think that is um, something to hold on to. I should also congratulate you on your book in 2010 which I didn't know was shortlisted for the Man Booker and long listed for the, I, I forget the two, uh, the, both were bookers, right? Thanks so much, Rahul. Um, I'll give you a copy later. You must, you must, you must sign it and give it to me because I have a long way back, so I'm gonna have time to read the book. Great. But thank you, thank you once Great. again. Um, it's colder than I expected. Yes, I hope what we're uh, lacking by way of temperatures made up for by warmth from the audience and from the conversation, and I hope the conversations here over the next two days uh, inspire and intrigue you artistically. Uh, Rahul, you have said that if you hadn't been an actor, you would be a writer. And uh, even as I say that, I, I realize that you are actually a writer, not if not a paperback writer. You, are, you have been a copywriter at some point in your career, and you've also, of course, been a writer-director of films. Uh, you've given us two very different films uh, <laughs> in the course of that writer-director career. Um, and I want to start with the first film that you wrote and directed, uh, Everybody Says I'm Fine, in 2001. And it's a, it's, it's a remarkable concept, so tell us how you hit upon it. Well, I bet nobody in this audience has seen the film. Um, so, the film is about a hairdresser who reads his customers' minds when he cuts their hair. And every customer walks into this posh salon and says, I'm fine, when he asks, how are you? But when he starts cutting their hair, he has the ability to read their minds and he realizes nobody is fine. The rich socialite has just been thrown out of a home by a husband because he has found someone else. And the actor, a cameo played by me, who keeps raving about the roles he's gotten, actually has no work and is on the verge of committing suicide. And the beautiful, rich heiress who comes in for her, for her stylish cut, has been subjected to um, sexual assault, which is incest. So he begins to hear the stories of these people and chooses to help them without them knowing that he knows. But he can't help himself. He's locked in a, he's locked in a, in a web of his past which prevents him from helping himself. So what he does is he has actualized all that pain to helping others. So basically the film says, everybody says I'm fine, but nobody is. And we could all be fine if only we admitted that we were not. This came from uh, a very, very close family member of mine who lived uh, her whole life, or the most parts of her life that I saw, artificially and didn't live it for the way she wanted. She lived it for the way she 
assumed society wanted to see her as. And it struck me, even as a child, that there were two sides to this woman. And that one side was much more preferable to the other, which was the side where, where she was herself. And that's where the genesis of the story came from, Daisy, which is, why can't we be ourselves? Why are we so fearful of people not liking us and therefore us changing ourselves or painting on brilliant colors? Because how long will that color last? Whereas if you are yourself in your own color, maybe 99 people less than the earlier amount would like you, but the one who remains will remain forever. So that's where the whole idea began to develop. And, and the hairdresser reading someone's minds was just, it's just a mad thought that came out of my mad head. And the next film I've written is, is even madder. <laughs> no, the next film which you haven't seen, okay. which I'm going to right. make. Okay. So, yeah, so the madness never stops. Wonderful, wonderful. And you've described writing as, um, writing and directing as more cerebral and more torturous than acting. Um, writing. writing. Writing is the toughest thing in the world. Yeah. Please don't call me a writer. Okay. I'm not a writer. Okay. Okay. I just okay. put some words on paper right. because I have to spit them out to make a movie. Sure. But you are a writer. I'm not. Oh my gosh. I'm a one book wonder. But yeah. No, that doesn't okay. matter. Both thoughts. <laughs> I mean, to write, to inhabit the worlds that you guys create, Right. And then the characters, and then to look at plot lines. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, uh, uh, it's I mean, just writing a screenplay every eight pages or nine pages. I just fall down on my bed as if somebody has, you know, punched me in the stomach and I don't get up for two hours. Right. And then I get up and I crawl back to the typewriter, to the laptop mm -hmm. and start to write again. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. But what do you do when an idea begins to emerge out of your body and embarrasses you in public because it starts to pop its head out here and head out here and you know come up out of your shoulder and out of the middle of your forehead yeah. which is quite a large one so it has lots of space so you know yeah. what do you do when 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 this this happens you have to write it mm -hmm. but direction no direction is not torturous at all I, I don't know. I, I think somebody might have conflated the two. Right. But I, I just love direction. Right. So tell us about Purna then, the 2017 film that Rahul directed, which is about Purna Malavat, um, an indigenous girl from Telangana district who is the youngest person to have scaled um, Mount Everest. And so I didn't write. Sorry, please. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. I didn't write Purna. It came to me written. Mm. And I even wasn't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to even direct it. And that happened towards the end of our pre-production schedule. But as things panned out, what a story. What a story. If you ever need any kind of affirmation that the system in this country works, and believe me, we do need that affirmation so many times, it is this story. Here is a 12 and a half, year, no, 13 year old tribal girl tending to her goats her family's goats in Pakala village in Telangana. By the age of 13, most parts of this country, if you're amongst the rural poor, it's time to either get married or to start working in the fields or as, it, as they say, hath batana in the house, etc. Same with Purna, except that she fortuitously, there was a tribal school that was open close by and it was for free and her parents said, okay, you go for a year and we'll get you married next year. Maybe the crops were bad, maybe they had, didn't have enough money, who knows? And it's in that year that Purna was studying in this tribal school that she began to dabble in rock climbing because every school had to have extracurriculars. So there was computers and some others, dance. And one of them was rock climbing. Now, Telangana is as flat as my palm, except there is one 600-foot rock, which for perspective is a 60-story building. There's a 600-foot rock in a place called Bhongir, where people learn rock rock. There's a fort on top, but it's a 
beautiful, clear face. And that's where people actually learn rock climbing, just as a kind of a hobby. The government has uh, uh, hired some adventure sports people. But they've also hired a guy who's climbed Everest, Shekhar Babu, to be one of the guys. He runs a, a company called Transcend. I hope he still does. To take kids up and down this rock. And so Purna becomes one of 30, 40 tribal kids who take on this rock climbing course and turns out to be very good at it. So Shekhar Babu goes to doc, uh, Dr. R.S. Praveen Kumar, who has since left the IPS, at the time was Secretary of Tribal and School Welfare, Tribal Schools, and says, look, these kids are really good at rock climbing. Maybe we should make them go mountaineering. He said, sure, where do you want to send them? He said, Himalayan Mountaineering Institute in Darjeeling. And uh, they go. And they break the uh, record there for climbing a, mo a mountain called Mount Renok. So now, Dr. R.S. Praveen Kumar takes a ridiculous leap in his head and says, what will this do to enthusiasm for tri of tribal parents to register their schools, their kids in tribal schools, if one of the kids climbed Everest? How will this galvanize their opinion, their thoughts about schooling for the positive? And so he takes this really massive leap and asks Shekhar Babu, can these guys go further? And Shekhar Babu says, probably all the way to Everest. And so nine months after Purna is tending to her goats in Pakala, nine months almost to the day, she becomes the youngest girl in history. The boy is 13 in the records. So she was just nine months older. She climbs Everest. I mean, it's, it's beyond my imagination. I've met her many, many, many times. Remarkable human being. Uh, part sage and part girl. 19-year-old now, 20-year-old girl. You have to be a sage to climb Everest. And part assassin also, right, to get there. And it is, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So they've closed, the, the age limit now is 16 from the Nepal side and 18 from the China side. No, the other way around. So they were like, a 13-year-old can't climb this. She could die, and she should have died. So the story that I, that I made focused not just on the mountaineering brilliance and it's six years ago, so I'm not even I'm not even peddling the film. It was on Amazon Prime for five years and now it's gone to Apple. Uh, it's not that, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, the story that I that fascinated me was what can an officer in India do within the ambit of his you know job description? Enforce, and here's the answer. He rectified the social welfare schools, cleaned them up, good food. Even today when you go to Telangana, you can see on the board the calorific count and the price of what you're eating on a daily basis. Fed these kids, schooled them, then these, these extracurriculars, got the best people to teach them. So literally, the system can work to put a tribal girl on Mount Everest in nine months. And that's what I found so life-affirming about the, the story, that the system, if it's implemented by honest, driven, passionate officers, can work miracles. So it's not the system that we have to fault, but the people who are actually implementing the system um, behind that system. The system actually is there. You can find wiggle room and get things done. Fabulous. So inspiring. Yeah. Um, I know we said we'd talk about books <laughs> and cinema, so we'll come back to the books. Um, I want to talk about the, some, of the, some of your most recognizable films that have been based on books. The Japanese Wife, English August, of course, uh, Midnight's Children, Midnight's Children. 
Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the classic uh, Rahul Bose interview begins with your work in English August. So I, I, I want to do something else for a change. We're under, it's just gone dark, but if it was light, we could see the cherry blossom trees. And that's, um, you know, a phenomenon of natural beauty that we share with Japan. So I want to ask you about the Japanese wife. Um, it's a wonderful film. I recently rewatched it. Aparna Sen's uh, cinematography, um, uh, you know, the silences and the characters, the endearing and uh, absolutely guileless characters are just uh, really stunning, a great work of art. Um, Kunal Basu says of you, you played Snehamoy, the um, character, the protagonist of the film, to perfection. And he says of you that you were a South Bombay, a hip South Bombay boy with hair slicked back and then you transformed yourself into this very rustic um, maths teacher from the Sundarbans, which is a very rural landscape. So tell us how you worked this magic and how you related to Kunal Basu's story. Oh God, with tears. I was terrified. Somewhere I knew I could play this guy, but I was terrified. Okay. Think of the leap, Daisy. Think of the leap from South Bombay to North Bombay, and then from North Bombay to Bengal, and then from Bengal to the Sundarbans. And then the Sun, I mean, the challenge was, yeah. of course it was challenging to play a village schoolmaster from rural Bengal, but what was even challenging was when he insisted on speaking English. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he spoke Bengali, that was a challenge enough because it is a very specific kind of Bengali. But when he spoke English, it was mad because I was like, okay, I have to unlearn this English uh, get into Bengali and then use that to learn this English. Mm. It was just, but uh, uh, Aparna helped me a lot. I can, without a shadow of doubt, say that I had no idea how to play this character till the day before the shoot. And my prep had started a good two, three months before. I had no idea. I was terrified. And then I got onto my cycle. I was living in Alipur at uh, the RPG guest house. Yeah, they were the producers, I think. And I put on my dhoti, his, his clothes. I put on his kurta, which I used to do. I put on his spectacles, put on his chappals, took my umbrella, got onto my cycle and began cycling the streets of New Alipur, of Alipur, in Calcutta, with this umbrella on my head. I mean, <laughs> it must have been beyond ridiculous to see this guy, you know, almost like out of a, like a caricature. And then suddenly I got it. As I was cycling, you know, there are these unathletic people who do athletic things so effortlessly. They'll just, you know, because they've done it so many times. They'll climb 240 steps to draw water from a well and come down. And they look like they would, they would faint if you asked them to do five jumps. But they do this every day because they just do it every day. So their muscles kind of know what to do. And so the schoolmaster, I mean, he could effortlessly cycle 10, 15 kilometers without thinking about it because it's just something that he used to do to go to schools and stuff like that. So as I was cycling, I got into that rhythm. That sort of watery, fluid, unthinking rhythm of not cycling, but just breathing. And as I did that, I got into a space where I could just sense the peace in this man. The genuine peace. The genuine sense of peace. Gentleness, peace, a little thought. Nothing held too tight, nothing clenched, just glide. And I, I, it was such a beautiful moment because I knew then that that's how I wanted to play him. Yeah. And then I thought of my father, who was such a gentle, genuinely a gentle man and tactile, adored playing with his children. Every day when he would come back from work for a couple of hours on the bed, we would be just 
horsing around. My mom would have none of that because she couldn't bear, you know, this kind of claustrophobic physical touch. I thought of him and I thought of his, the way he cooked and the way he kissed us and the way he used to um, hold us and just life, he, 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 was, he was water. I thought, you know, I, to put all of this together, so th I have channeled my dad in a few places yeah. in that film. Yeah. And um, I look a little bit like him also, if you, if, if you ever saw photographs of my father. I did see him in the Farooq Sheikh uh, interview. <laughs> oh my, you've been there. Yeah, I've been okay, there. That, so then, that's, that's, we're not going there today, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, but we can, of course we can. So, um, Kunal's short story is exactly that. It's a short story. Unlike the long, longer form of writing that I love the way I'm holding forth on this when Daisy's here, but there you have to actually do the work, get into the whole anthropological, cultural, social um, milieu of what you're writing about, go, go back into the past if you have to, etc., etc. I'm not so sure Kunal did all of that. Again, I'm not sure, but it was skinny. And to take that and to make that into a film is very different than taking something like Midnight's Children or English August, which is fully fledged, muscular, multi-layered, you know, and taking that and, in fact, there you say, what do I take out to make the film two hours? Whereas here you, Operna was probably saying, what do I put in to build on this story to make it a, a heavy, uh, independent piece of work? So I suspect she did that because if you read the, the, the short story after the film, you're like, hang on, it's not that well, you know, fleshed out as it is in the movie. It's quite the reverse. And so, I fe I, and so similarly with Snehamoy, it's not, you don't get all the cues. I mean, you get Salim Sinai yes. a thousand times over yeah, when you read Midnight's Children or you get uh, uh, Agastya Sen from English August. So here you had to fill in some gaps, which I love doing. As a person, I just love being left alone to imagine. Uh, so those gaps were filled and and yeah, Kunal was there and he, he was quite uh, quite happy. Wonderful. It reminds me of what Dave Benegal says. Uh, he says, uh, cinema is the silence between words. Yeah, he's dead right. Uh -huh. Great. He's dead right. Beautiful. Beautifully put. Uh, I, want to, I want to ask you, Rahul, about language because that's Bangla and English, both you are comfortable in. Um, and English is something that, you know, millions of us have made our own. You know, there's chutneyfication and there's indigenization and you've, you've, uh, you, you play around with language. You bring it, you bring biography into it. You bring your own research into it. Um, what, what, are, what are the influences on your English? Is it Hollywood? Is it the English language stage? Um, is it Shakespeare? You went to an English medium school, so what, what, what is your English informed by? Huh. Uh, I guess a little bit of school, yeah. and I guess a little bit of travel, mm. and I guess uh, you tailor your English to who you're talking to. Sure. Yeah. So I certainly wouldn't speak, if I had to speak English, mm -hmm. I wouldn't speak it this way if I was talking to a bunch of Japanese. So even language takes on different avatars depending on who you're talking to. My Hindi would be very different with um, uh, my aunt and uncle uh, from Punjab as it would with a taxi driver in Bombay. So I think in that respect, within a language, there are many languages, but the way I'm speaking it now would be school, travel, uh, you know, I, I, I think that unaccented, clearly spoken English requires no, I hate people who put on accents when they talk to other people, uh, you know, suddenly somebody's in Scotland for three months and they're speaking this weird English and somebody's just flown in from Hong Kong and flown to Hong Kong and something's happened to their English. I can't bear it. So I, 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 I speak this way 
I spoke this way at a, at a similar Q&A in New York, and I'm doing it here, and that doesn't change. Yeah. But what it is, yeah. I think, is a bit of school, a bit of, I don't know, I don't know. You know, because it can't be the people I've been meeting for the last 30 years in the industry, because um, most of them don't have English as their first language. They have other languages as their first language, but I dream in English, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are, uh, we're very confident in the English that we speak. Um, you know, we've made it our own. But oftentimes, uh, I find that when it's, it's great in novels and it's, uh, it's very convincing, but uh, there's some English language cinema that we make that, um, that doesn't quite convince. Awful. Right? <laughs> Awful. I don't know, I, what happens to people when they start I'm speaking? I'm curious about 15 Park you. Avenue. Yeah. I, it, it didn't always work for me. It didn't work for me in the way that the Japanese wife worked. Correct. So, uh, so, no, but English August works a lot. Yeah, we'll come to English August. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the thing is, so here's the thing. When you start speaking a language that's not yours, it must not seem alien. That's, that's the basic responsibility of an actor. And almost every English language film I've seen, it's like, what are they, why are they speaking like this? I don't want to mention names, but some very famous actors have massacred their performances with just stilted, weird yeah. intonations of, of the English language. And having said that, it happens with Hindi, it happens with every language. It's the basic responsibility of an actor to make the audience feel at ease in terms of the sense of place the actor is coming from with language. So, uh, recently I did a show for Netflix called Eternally Confused and Eager for Love. And I played the tyrannical father. And I was ad-libbing life left, right and center. It's scary how easy the tyrannical father came to me. But having said that, because you know, he was moving in, in and out of English and Hindi. And you just have to, once you understand that this is the guy, then you gotta run with it. You can't let God knows some influence from your real life enter the way you deliver language as the character. It's unforgivable. You know, we can't be asking you for your money for that. It's, 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 it's fundamental. So, yeah. Right. And I love what you did uh, for Split Wide Open, which is this wonderful film and it's available online, so please watch it. Yeah, I, I was halfway there. I know, but I, I, okay, so you say you, uh, you rated your performance at 65%. So the acting was better than the language delivery. The language delivery was about 50%. I see. It was and halfway there. The, right. the acting was much better. Okay, but I love what you did. You did the ethnography. I mean, you took the script and then you took it to the Bombay slums and you got Bombaya into your language. Um, so I sat, I spent a month in the slums. Yeah. I spent a month with these boys in the Kulaba slums. Yeah. I could never spend the night there because the cops would come and raid for drug, you know, drug busts and stuff and imagine an actor being raided there and saying, no, 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 I was just here doing research for a film. I was like, yeah, right, come on, here we go. So, you know, but this was, this was in the 90s, yeah. uh, late 90s. And um, what's the word? Is it argot? What, you know, the, the language that they speak, what's the word, the English word for, anyway. Yeah, maybe, yeah, but uh, the, the way they spoke, I made them read the script and they couldn't, I mean, I think uh, the writers had fancied that they'd gotten it right. Of course they hadn't. So the syntax, the rhythm, all of that I got from them. Uh, this is Bombay. Only entry, no exit. That's how he read it. This is Bombay, only entry, no exit. So, that's what I said. And when I would tell them the meaning of that English, that English line, they would say, and then they would turn it to, you know, their own English. But, you know, you gotta do this for a long time. A month is too short. So, I think the unease at worst and self-consciousness at best shows for half the performance in that film. Yeah, I don't but, think so, but yeah, but in his silences, yeah. in KP's silences in the lovemaking with Leila Ruas, where she actually takes my clothes off and decides to ravage me in this weird colonial thing happening, you know, kind of allegory. 
or for example in my relationship with the slum girl Didi who I call Didi and my search for her where there's not much said that I think was affecting sure. um, but when it came down to his pieces to camera I felt right yeah wow. yeah <laughs> okay we 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 will uh, we'll let the audience judge um, okay, we, we can't not talk about Midnight's Children because we've been talking about language and chutneyfication and I know that you, uh, Salman Rushdie actually selected you to play Salim Sinai in a series on the film or a film on the book that didn't, that di that didn't happen. But you have, in Deepa Mehta's 2012 film, you have a small but significant role in the film. So what do you make of the book? the chutneyfied language and its filmic rendition. If there's anything that can break your heart as an actor, it's what happened to me. Because I think that Salim Sinai is one of the greatest roles written for an Indian actor ever in a book. I mean, forget about the book, forget about the writer, just the role is to die for. And after 147 actors had been auditioned by the BBC in 1997, eight, I forget. Salman chose me and the BBC chose me and I remember getting that call late at night because it was 7.15 in England and it was about 11.45 here and I just let out this long scream, just one syllable long scream into the phone and prosthetics and the whole thing started, the whole BBC machinery started and then for reasons I don't want to get into here, it got shelved and it broke my heart. It just broke my heart. And that's when I said, my God, this is the profession. This is what I've signed up for. This is the yo-yo, the roller coaster you're going to have to go on. And 20 years later, Deepa, 20 or 18 or 15 years later, Deepa Mehta is making Midnight Children into a movie and Salman is writing it and working with Deepa and they both call me up and say, we want you to play General Zulfikar. And I'm laughing and uh, uh, Deepa and Salman are laughing because we all know that this was what happened. Like, this would not have been the case 20 years ago. And I hate the idea of doing anything but Salim Sinai in this film. So every fiber in my being is saying, kick it aside. Absolutely say no to this. Relive the humiliation and the crushed dreams of 20 years ago. And do not forgive. Um, yeah, but of course it's not any of their fault, right? So it, it was not. So yeah, of course I said yes, just for a trip down memory, memory lane. But playing General Zulfikar and the way he constructs his English, and I mean, it's... it's, 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 it's the book is brilliant in terms of the way it, 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 has, it does pyrotechnics and gymnastics with the language. But even General Zulfikar, playing General Zulfikar with Anita Mojumdar, who is a really talented dancer, actress from Canada. And I hope she's well. Um, oh, she played Emerald. We had the best time. I loved the role. And I remember going to Deepa at one point and saying to her, you know what I'm missing about General Zulfikar? I'm missing stillness. I wish there was a moment where we could just see him in repose. And she said, you know, okay, let me think about it. It's not in the book. It's too minor a character. Are you trying to increase your role in slimy ways? I said, of course I am, but that's not the reason why. I really do believe it'll be nice. And she came up with this beautiful, has anyone seen Midnight Children? It, you've seen everything. And it, there's a part where General Zulfikar, who is a Pakistani general, loses the war to India. And he's sitting alone in a room, waiting for the helicopter to come to take him away from the field of battle. All he has to do is sign the surrender papers and go. So he's just waiting, just the moment before he has to sign. And he's just sitting alone. And he's stuffy and arrogant and insufferable. So the role came very easy to me. 
and um, he notices a speck on his shoe. And he just takes out his handkerchief and just goes oh my God. and puts it back and assumes his posture again. As if, you know, he's still the king of the castle. Just before the moment that he has to, you know, be taken away. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so, um, you've done Midnight's Children and then you've done English August, with which one journalist has called the unsung twin of Midnight's Children. Ah. <laughs> Satish Padmanabhan in Outlook has called it the unsung twin, which I found really interesting. So, what do you make of the two books and the two films? I haven't really compared the two books. Mm -hmm. There definitely is a kind of interiority. Uh, there definitely is a kind of interiority about both books, both characters. Yeah. Uh, English, August, I mean, it's remarkable that Dave and Upamanyu could adapt that into a, 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 a sort of a screenplay. Mm. The book is not that cinematic. Sure. Nowadays, books are written with an eye on cinema. Yeah. So they're written cinematically, mm. but that wasn't. And it's remarkable. Has anyone seen English August? Uh, it's not available, right? Is it's it, not available, but it's, it's, I mean, yeah. the only people who will warily put their hands up are those who are not afraid of their age being caught right. uh, at this point of time. <laughs> uh, because it's, it's like... It's, yeah, 1994. It's a clear 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I saw it, saw it at the time, but... It's faded from memory. Yeah, no, I was too young to see it, so I have no, I have no, <laughs> okay. no recollection at all. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, English August. Um, what can I say? Dream debut. It's just a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And he does nothing. I mean, yes. he does a few things, but sure. nothing really eventful. Mm. I just loved it. You just have to be. What a beautiful way to start your cinematic journey, in a in a role that you just have to be. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just have no idea where the camera is. Yeah. You don't care. You're just interior-ish. Yeah. And that's what you... And, and you know, look, so let me just say this to you. I believe the greatest writing, acting, uh, any kind of art, or you're gazing at art, shouldn't be thrust down your throat. You know, when my mother used to eat pan, and she used to finish eating pan, and she would say something to me, there would be that beautiful fragrance of pan on her breath. It wasn't, I'm eating pan and I'm blowing on, onto your face. It was, I finished it and there's just a lingering fragrance. And I think that's what art should, should be like. It should be given in that way, just a fragrance. And you can make of it what you will. And English August and films like that allow you to do that. Allow the audience to make their own movie. As opposed to, now this is going to happen. Now shut up and listen to these drums. And now these bullets will go. And now this person is dying. No, no, he's not dying. He's dying, dying. He's not dying, dying. He's dying, dying, dying. <laughs> Fabulous, yeah. I, I know we're running out of time. I just want to remind uh, our audience that English August was the film that really brought you to the world. I mean, you were called the front man of everything bold and experimental and different coming out of India. Um, yeah, I mean, fabulous achievement. Um, Rahul, your whole story, your, your, your journey, uh, your growth as an artist has been a real inspiration. Um, I just want to end by asking you uh, where you think we're at in terms of excellence and how does the reading culture impact uh, the way we are? It depends what you read. Sure. You can read nonsense mm -hmm. and or WhatsApp forwards your whole life. Mm -hmm. Depends what you read. And not only depends on what you read, even if you read the right things, depends what lens you look at them through. What do you retain out of that? What do you take out of that? Sure. So it's so subjective, Daisy, it right? It is, it is. It's yeah. so crazy subjective. Sure. But I do think one thing, yeah. and that is the idea of reflection. What have I done today as a human being? And how has it 
affected me spiritually, physically, sensorially. How has it affected me today? Very, very few people reflect. It's astonishing. Mm-hmm. You know, they just keep moving on, keep moving on. They don't, nobody reflects. And I think that I've written this piece on being an actor where I say, um, shame and regret are our salvation. Yeah. And it's true. So many times you're asked the question, if you had to live your whole life again, would you do it the same way? Any regrets? And most people say, oh God, no. I would do the same thing all over again. I have no, are you mad? I, I'm riddled with regrets. The graveyard scene in Bombay Boys. <laughs> the girlfriend I treated badly when I was 23. Yeah. You know, the, God knows the, horrendous outfit I wore, wherever. I mean, come on. Come on. There's so many ways to be a better human being from what you've done in the past. There are so many ways to have, to get to that peaceful, beautiful place, which is equilibrium and self-respect and self-worth and love. So for me, all of that it's, 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 it's a continuing process and I don't know where I went with this. You started somewhere and I took it somewhere else. But, you know, I think that um, yeah. reading, yeah, reading, it, it's, it's... In the widest sense, yeah. Meant, yeah the widest sense You have sense to be that kind of human being. The reflective What's the point culture? of putting words in front of you otherwise? Sure. Yeah. I just want to end with a quote from uh, Split Wide Open, which KP says. So it's, it's towards the end of the film and he's... Um, he says, uh, this is television, this is not God. And I think uh, Rahul has uh, kind of taken that to heart. He's leapt out of the screen. He's brought the struggle for equality and the search for excellence into the streets, into the playing fields, into our schools. Uh, and I think Rahul Bose gives us hope in uncertain times. Rahul, it's been a real pleasure to interview you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are we going to take some questions? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yes. I mean, if somebody isn't frozen enough, or bored enough. <laughs> I would have loved to continue. Let's go. Let's continue. What do I care? Mary. Okay. We'll, t- we'll do questions. And I-, I think things will emerge. Do you guys have time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So should we what, spend about, Mary, 15, 20 minutes? Are you okay with that? Are you too frozen? Listen, whoever's bored can just leave. It's okay. It's, I'm, I'm used to that. It's no problem. Uh, yeah, one question. Uh, I remember a long time back, 2008, I watched your movie, Shaurya. Uh, could you have done a role reversal with uh, K.K. Menon? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Short answer to a long question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one more question. No, you can't. You can't get greedy. Otherwise, I would have given you a long answer. Uh, Unless there's nobody else asking a question, then you can go for it. I'm sure there are. Hands. So I happen to have seen Shorya. You were brilliant. But if you had to essay the role of Abhinandan, how would you prepare for it? Uh, the Air Force officer who was a national hero three years back. Abhinandan? The one who was. I don't know enough about that story. Oh, okay. I don't know enough about that story. Hi. Hi, Rahul. Yeah. Uh, I was quite uh, motivated from your movie, Shorya, but I would like to ask you the role which uh, was played by KK Memon as uh, Brigadier Pratap. Was it a real uh, story based on a real life? And what motivated you to make that story? I didn't make the story, Samar Khan made the story. And I don't know whether it was what was real, what was not. I just know that it's a remake of A Few Good Men, as you might have realized. Those who've seen A Few Good Men, it was a, a remake or a whatever you call it. But I know I, I, the, I have no answers to those questions. I really, really don't know. Okay, thank you. Thanks. You're back. Is 
there any role that you regret not doing? Salim Sanai. Salim Sanai. Salim Sanai. <laughs> Definitely. I'm uh, just thinking any other role that I came close to. Uh, a suitable boy was not made into, until now that Mira's made it, but it was made into a radio play where I played Harish, the suitable boy, the boring man who always had impeccable shoes. Nothing much has changed. Um, but that would have been that would have been cool to do in when I had been that age when I was that age. But it uh, that never got made at the time. That, that would have been interesting to do, but no regrets, of course. Thank you. Do you regret that you were not born around the time when uh, I'm not just born? We were you know, not grown up enough when such a the Satyajit Ray was making yes. this. Yeah. You do? Massive. Oh, wow. Why? He died when I just started acting in cinema. Okay. Literally. 1992, he passed away and we were shooting in 1992. Uh, God, what a... Don't get me started because he's just an incredible, incredible Especially artist. Especially the role in uh, Pratidwanti. I mean, I've seen everything. I've seen all Ray. And I've met people who've worked with him. Spent hours with them and heard about what he, how he used to be. Oh, you God, I just, it's just like a, it's a knife to my heart that I could never work with him. Because I, I really think, if you see the Japanese wife, the way um, Ane Goswami has shot it, he shot it like the new Ray. If you watch Ray's movies and you watch the Japanese wife, Ane has taken and made it, the cinematography is like Ray 2 2.0. Just beautiful his work. And there are so many shades of Ray in, 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 in the stuff that Oporna does sometimes. But not Ray, of course, obviously. And it, I mean, he, it would have just... It's like, it's painful to talk about it because that's how badly I want to work with that man every time I see or re-see his movies. It's, you know, and I, I remember when I was the theater actor, because in 1992 I wasn't young, I was 25. So it wasn't that I was 12. And I was aware that, you know, he had, had gotten his honorary Oscar a few years prior, he was very ill. I was like, I wish I could work with him, I wish I could work with him, I wish I could work with him, and it obviously just never happened. But uh, I began to watch his movies since I was, um, I'm a Bombay boy, so I'm a Probashi, I'm, it's not that I lived in Calcutta. But I began to watch his films since I was 17, 18. And then I went through that whole phase of Ray and Goddard and, and uh, you know, and um, uh, Bunuel and Truffaut and uh, uh, Kurosawa and all of them. And, but the one that stuck with me the most was Ray. I guess because there's something so uh, viscerally connected culturally that I just... I, don't get me started. I can't believe Pothir Panchali was his first film. I cannot believe it. I mean... What a, what a genius. Thank you so much for the question. Can I ask you one? Uh, of course, you couldn't work with Ray, unfortunately, but which director you like working the most? You know? um, I have a long, long, long time ago stopped working with directors who are bad human beings. Many fine artists in the world are bad human beings. We have the history from great painter artists to great directors to great writers who have actually left a trail of broken, uh, broken minds and broken hearts uh, in their wake. So it's very important to me that the both belong together, a good human being and a good director. I would much rather work with a good human being who's an average director than a great director who's not a, cool human, not a good human being. That's just not going to happen. It's too much of... It, it, I, don't, I don't want this so badly. I want that so badly. I think Oparna, uh, Oparna Sen would be, uh, in my opinion, the person I've had the best 
equation with. Uh, she's she's a good human being. She's a cool she's a cool chick, and um, she's um, she's. Don't worry, I, I I say that to her face, and she's like, she calls me Brando, not because of my acting skills, but because I mumble, and she says, Brando, you cannot talk to me like this. And I call her PD, which is short from prima donna, because. Whenever I shot with her in Bengal, people used to fall at her feet. I'm like, what is going on here? Because one moment I see a human being, next moment the human being's vanished. Where's the human being gone? They're at Oppurna Sen's feet. So she's just, but you know, we're also good friends. We can hang out. We can we can talk. We can argue. We fight. Uh, <laughs> we fight on the set and off. But that's the kind of relationship. I remember doing 15 Park Avenue, and there was Shabana Azmi. Wahida ji, Konkona and Oporna. I thought I was in female heaven. I was like, what? Just don't, don't let me wake up from this dream, you know? It was just astonishingly lucky to be amongst such, um, such forces. It was great. Uh, hi, sir. Um, Prabir. Uh, it is quite evident that uh, when, when somebody looks at your filmography, you have a very uh, special set of selecting the films right, the genre of films that you have done over the years. So is there any a special process uh, like you go through when you select a film or when a project comes to you? And one, the second question is, uh, we saw you in a very small bit in the latest lit trailer, Salam Vengi. So mm. could you tell us a little bit about your role in that? So the answer to your two questions is yes and no. <laughs> The first one is, is there thought process behind? Obviously there is. It's not just, you know, <laughs> not by fluke that this career is made. But I remember somebody telling me a career is made by what, not what you say yes to, but what you say no to. So I've been really good at saying no. And I say no, and <laughs> which is why I don't, you know, I don't live in a Ali Shan Mahal and all of that stuff. Uh, yeah. Lots of no's, few yeses. One misstep out of 45 films, one film I regret. Uh, and as far as, um, as far as selecting films, Probi, I think it's about appetite. If you've done five comedies, you just want to do something more serious. It's also about the director, the actors. You can't act alone. It's a tennis match. You need to play tennis with somebody better than you so you can raise your game as opposed to playing tennis with a bunch of newcomers where your game falls. The story, the, the, does my character drive the movie? If you took my character out of the movie, would I, would I have, uh, would the movie be the same? If it wouldn't be, then do it. Salam Venki is, is different. It's, it's, it's a wonderful theme. It's just got a wonderful storyline. Uh, Revati is great. Uh, the actors led by Kajol are fine. Um, it's for me, when you see the film, you'll realize that it's a film that I wanted to be a part of. And it, has, it will have not much to do with my filmography, but more to do with my preoccupations as a human being. So I think, uh, so very happy to be part of that project. Hello. Hey, I'm right here in the back. Yes. Uh, number one, you're a really funny guy. So I didn't know that all these years. I really yeah, nobody, nobody I kind of, Puts, puts, yeah, they all surprised. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you did one of our really good movies when we were in college. That was Jankar Beat. Like, it was really commercial, but it was really well made. But I really liked you in Chameli. Yeah? So Chameli, where did that fit? Is that commercial? Is that arty? Because I just enjoyed it. And so here's the thing. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Abhijit Chaki. Bon. Abhijit, here's the thing. This is my thing, okay? This is not some gospel thing. My definition of an art house film versus a commercial film is very simple. Can you tell what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. If you can't tell what's going to happen next, then it's an art house film. If you can tell what's going to happen next, then it's a commercial film. It's made with a formulaic construct. Now, there could be terrible art house films, and there could be superb commercial films, and there could be art house films made commercially. And commercial stories made artistically, Mr. and Mrs. Ayer. Yeah. It's a formula film. Mm -hmm. Two strangers meet on a bus, obviously. Duh. They're going to fall in love. And we're going to see what's going to happen next. And it's going to be tragic. 
etc., etc., etc. The stage is set for that, right? But it's done so beautifully, so sensitively and so artistically that people think maybe it's an art house movie, not for me. Everybody says I'm fine as an art house film. You have no clue what's going to happen next. Now, whether it's made well or badly, as I said, is different from the definition fundamentally of an art house film versus a commercial film. And that's my definition. There are many art house stories that are made in this larger than life, really wow kind of way, whereas actually you don't know what's going to happen next. Someone with a sense of that kind of whimsy and madness is Wes Anderson. You don't know where his films are going next, but they're made unapologetically, you know? They're not made with uh, a kind of, uh, okay, this is going to be realistic, down to earth sensibility. I mean, he's the king of whimsy and, and, and design and all of that. So that's my way. So Chameli is, in my opinion, um, you, uh, it's a bit of both, but I think the, the exposition of Chameli, the way it has been made, uh, again, is a bit of both. It's not really realistic, gritty cinema. I mean, you can see from the very first frame. And neither is it over-the-top, gratuitous commercial, you know, commercialization of the, of the story. Somewhere in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, so there's new research uh, that when it comes to reading, when we read a particular scene, for example, somebody's running, then the same portions of our brains light up. You know, uh, we get the mental benefits of running without actually running. So when you... <laughs> You're going to make millions. <laughs> People are going to stop exercising and <laughs> just read about <laughs> I'm doing, no, I'm doing no, Pilates. You don't get physical me. benefits out of it, only mental benefits. So my question to you is that when you portray a role, especially the uh, roles you've been portraying lately, you know, Bulbul, uh, and uh, even in Dil Dharakne, though, that's not a very nice guy. So when you portray those roles, what does it do to your own psychology? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, has anyone seen Bulbul? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, yeah. I've seen Bulbul. So it's, I think, um, you have to be fearless to go into the darkest corners, corners of your imagination, not your soul. The darkest corners of your imagination and gouge them and irritate them and make them bleed to actually bring a performance like Bulbul to life. I mean, it was so exhausting. It was so exhausting to go there, just to go into those two spaces of those two guys, especially the, um, you know, uh, mentally uh, differently abled brother and um, the rape sequence. I, so, so difficult. Do, does it stay with you? Does a part of your character stay with you? No, but the moment and the process that you went through to get there stays with you. What you had to imagine to convincingly portray that brother, Indrani land, what was... Uh, Is it Mahesh or Ma uh, Mahendra? Or Mah Mahendra. For Mahendra to do what he did, what I had to think about to get there, to actually get there two seconds before the rape, that I remember. Dead clear. And I remember what convinced me to, like, yeah, this is the way to do it. And I can share that with you. When you're a 10-year-old child trapped in a 40-year-old's body and you're the rich, richest kid or 40-year-old in the state, you're, you're the Zamindar's twin brother. Everything is given to you. I want that, lelo bache. I want that, lelo bache. I'm feeling sleepy, please go to sleep. I want food, lelo bache. Similarly, when he wants sex, or a woman in his 40-year-old brain. Don't forget, he can eat, sleep, and have sex like an adult. But otherwise, the rest of it, he doesn't have the faculties to. 
So when he points at something, it's his. He's never had to understand that there's a, a social process to these things. So that's, he just points. He gets the urge and he points. And it could be massively triggering for people watching this, for, pe for, for Tripti who's doing it. And, but I, that's the process I said, he just points. This is it. He's hungry, he's thirsty, he's sleepy, he wants to go to the loo. This is one of those things, boom. Boom, finished out. Not for him, those questions that, you know, suppression of your conscience, nothing. Nothing at all. But doing it with Tripti for eight hours on that uh, bed, because, you know, shooting takes a long time. And she just, I said, look, the safe word is Rahul. Any point, because I'm not going to be Rahul when the camera rolls. I'm going to be Mahindra. But the safe word is Rahul. You just say Rahul, boom, out. That's me. That's me here. That's the guy who's fought for gender justice for 20 years. Relax, it's me. It's me, I'm right here. I'm here. You know, and, and, and we were great and we were cracking jokes and after some time we even stopped going to the makeup room. We would just roll off and just, you know, sit and chill and, you know, get the blankets on and just chat and crack a few jokes and then go back into it. But it was really exhausting because we owe it to you to make it a terrible, harrowing experience for you. And if we don't go through that, then it's not going to happen. And so there are, it's still wonderful, the profession, but it depends how, how, how deep you want to go into it, man. If you want to get into it, then it's going to be tough. Okay, I'm going to wrap up by saying that, um, you know, like a good actor, Rahul Bose is cruel to himself, and every good actor is cruel, <laughs> cruel to themselves. That's the mark of a good actor. I know we had an excellent session on Shah Rukh Khan um, just before our session, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, I am, and I'm sure you will be very glad that we've given the last word to Rahul Bose. Thank you so much, Rahul, and good night. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to the festival. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. I think I have a session at 350? Yes. 50. We're going to be talking about sport, so something a little more uplifting. <laughs> Not the reading kind, the, the playing kind. <laughs>